So we're here with Sonia. I'm super happy to have uh, to have you in the Crazy TV podcast. Uh, welcome. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for welcoming us at your place. I want to start right off by asking you a question that um, maybe a lot of people are asking themselves because you are so su successful and I always wonder personally, how did you start it? What happened when you started? Was it a struggle? Uh, can you describe the first moment of your business? It goes way back. Um, I never started a business. It was never an intention to start a business. What I did was I had these intuitive skills from the time I was a child. And I came from a big family, seven kids. And I discovered when I was around 10, 11, that I could get attention by using my intuitive skills, by sharing what I knew that wasn't obvious. And, and it would be interesting because I could sense things coming. I could sense um, um, who would be on the phone. This is way before call, you know, caller ID. I could sense when my dad would come home, and it became a game. So as I got a little bit older, I could sense other things. And people that were friends of my parents or f would start asking me intuitive questions. And so I ended up doing what's called a reading. And I was good at it. So it just kept going. And by the time I was in college, I had a business. People kept coming and coming and coming. And it was just what I did. So um, along those lines, eventually I got tired of doing only the readings. I wanted to teach people to do it themselves. Mm. So I had this idea that I would have a class um, and teach people to use their intuition. Because to me, it was so obvious. And I had three people. I had a woman who worked at a, at a, like a dry cleaners. Her brother was a truck diver. He came in and out of town and he had a local girlfriend. He was married, but he had a girlfriend in, in town. So the three of them came and I'm like a kid and they are my class. And I did it every Sunday for two hours. At first I thought, nobody's going to come. They're not going to come. And they loved it. So it just went from that to then I did it again. And then they said, we want to bring our friends. And so by the time I was 20, 21, I was busy. So it just kept going for me. So um, I didn't think of it as a business. I think of it as a way to get through college, you know, pay my way through college. But what I discovered was I would go get jobs and got fired from every job. I was not a good employee. Really? Why? I didn't want to be told what to do. I, um, I just resented it. I just felt like I didn't want to be controlled. And so I was a waitress. I got fired. I worked at an office where they sold men's clothing. I got fired. Um, were, you, were you just rebelling? or? No, I was a nice person. I just was not following those exact rules. There was always too exact for me. And being intuitive is being spontaneous. And being hyper-controlled is the opposite of my nature and what I was teaching. It's like, wait a minute, your inner self can, you know, know how to, like as a waitress, for example, I could talk to people. I could manage to get the food to the table and have a good, good experience. And But the manager wanted it to be this system, this protocol, this way of doing things. And I felt that it was very contradictory to my nature. Mm. So, so I wouldn't do it. I just simply kept doing my own thing. And I realized by the time I was 21 or 22 that perhaps a traditional life and a traditional path wouldn't work for me. Not because it's bad, because I felt that what it asked of me was asking of people the wrong thing. It gave no room for spontaneity, no room for creativity, no room to give feedback, and it was a problem for me. And where were you living at the time? I was living in Colorado. So then I had the bright idea to become a flight attendant. I wanted to travel. Yeah. 
And um, so I became a flight attendant, and that worked because when you get on an airplane, they have your system, but you're, you're kind of in your own world. Nobody's there. That worked for a little while. But even that, there was a uniform, there was a protocol, there was, you know, like you had to wear, I was always rebellious in a very small way, like you had to wear black, very somber shoes. And I found little clip-on bows with polka dots on them and would put them on my shoes. <laughs> subtle rebellion. Always subtle, never rude, never, I'd always just, just a spin or a twist of color, you know, just a, so so that worked. That lasted for a little while, not very long. And they 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 were having trouble. And they said, if you quit, you can have passes. You can fly for free. Oh. You know, if there's a seat, but we don't pay you unemployment. So I quit. That's how I ended up in France. I quit, and my intuition told me to go to France. It was a while ago. Uh... It was a while. It was twenty. Two and I went to the Sorbonne. So that's when I, I decided that I had enough experience with work to realize that to work in a traditional situation, you had to suppress a lot of your spontaneity and your creativity. <laughs> I'm sorry, I tasted one. Of, it's my mint. So what I realized is that If you work for a company, you risk losing your creativity. You risk because I never, every job I had actually didn't want my creativity. Now, I didn't exactly pursue the most creative fields. You know, maybe if I would have been an actress or I would have been in, you know, advertising and coming up with, Commercial, I could have maybe done a different experience, but my experience was that what traditional companies were asking, and even education, I even struggled in school because I thought, why am I learning this? What is the value of this? It was really a problem for me. And why am I not learning what I already was teaching? Trust your intuition, trust your creativity. And questioning. Or and questioning, my goodness, it was not allowed. It was just like learn, memorize, follow. And I felt like that was creating for me being a sheep. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do it. So I just kept doing what I was doing with no business plan, just having such, a, such an, a, an authentic experience that it didn't matter. As long as I could pay my rent, as long as I could get my needs met, that was enough reward for me, and it just grew. And when, when, when was the, the tipping point, when you went from having those jobs and but still with this rebellion mindset and then going full-time? Here was the tipping point. It was very interesting. Okay, I had the flight attendant job, and I could work by season. So I could work for three months and take a break and not lose my job. So then they, in 1987... So it was before you were born, um, the airline went on strike, okay? And I had a client that I was doing intuitive counseling with who was the head of another airline. And she said, well, forget that job. We'll hire you. And this was in Chicago. She said, come for an appointment and we'll hire you. We'll give you the same job better. I am driving to the job. And all of a sudden, I just got off the highway and went home. I just couldn't go. And at the time I was married and my husband had loved free passes. He loved free travel. He was very upset that I did not go. I said, I didn't go. And I said, I can't. I have to do my work. And it's like, what do you mean? What about our passes? What about travel? I said, I don't know. So two weeks, literally two weeks later, I had done an intuitive um, counseling for this guy. I didn't know him. He was a writer, and he wrote an article about me and about his experience. And it went national. It went into 150 newspapers and magazines that, like, a couple weeks later. And the next thing I know, everybody in the world's calling me. And that's how it happened. If I hadn't got off the highway, I would be a flight attendant, And you wouldn't know me. 
I don't, I didn't have a thought of why, just anything, everything in me said, don't go. Mm. And I didn't, but I, you know, if you're going to live like that, you have to have the courage to stand up against the, what are you thinking? And where do you do and explain yourself? And I said, I'm just trusting my vibes. But that's something I, I was wondering, um, what it would be to live like you live your life It's intuitively like, because this is one of those things, right? You, this is the thing. I call it dancing in the fire. I have to dance in the fire of everybody's intellectual control and disapproval. My husband was furious with me. And because for him, me leaving a job that was just, you know, for him, It was free passes, it was insurance, it was, it was like, but you don't do the job. I have to do the job and I, I need to, I'm called to do something else. And so I always think the intuitive living is moments of choice. I could have gone, I could have ignored that impulse, right? And I would have had a whole different life. And the way I am is if I have that impulse, I don't think about it. I just go with it and it has always worked out. Bitter. I mean, who could imagine 150 magazines writing about me? Never. <laughs> Never. And I am confident that if I had gone that way, then, then it wouldn't have happened. So to me, they're doors. And you just have to have the courage to jump in the door and not need to know the outcome. Yeah. It's, 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 it's not for the weak of, you know, you have to be courageous. But to me, the reward was not money or security. The reward is I'm being myself. Yeah, this is what I like about what you do, because obviously there is the, um, there is the question also of where does the, this intuition come from? And I know that we are very different. We're thinking very differently on this side, but it doesn't matter, actually, because for those who are not uh, familiar with uh, uh, Sonia's work, it's, it's really... Uh, very spiritual, if I can say, yeah. put it in those words. You talk about angels, you talk about forces in the universe and so on, which is fine. I, I don't, I, it's just not my beliefs. But still, I love what you do because it translates in so many different words. Follow your heart, for, be courageous and listen to yourself. And I even have language for people who don't relate to the unseen yeah. world. There is an invisible world. So sure. it's like, If you're going to be just in your intellect, it's like being an AM radio. You have this much bandwidth. And if you're going to be intuitive, your first brain is not your intellectual brain. It's your heart brain. And science already says your heart is a, is a conscious organ that is 5,000 times more sensitive to energy than your brain brain, your head brain. And then your stomach is even more, as, as much more than your head brain. So it's like your head brain's like an AM radio, your gut brain is like an FM radio, and your heart brain is like a satellite. It just picks up more bandwidth. It picks up more information energetically. So you don't have to believe in angels and you don't have to believe in anything. Just be aware there's more than meets the eye. And at the same time, I love this quote. I shared this quote on, on social media uh, uh, recently. It's like, follow your heart, but bring your brain with you. I love exactly. it. Exactly. Because this is something we don't talk no, about sometimes. No, I have a good conversation with that. Your heart is the leader. Your brain is the helper. Mm, yes. And they have to work together. And when your brain tries to be the leader, it's, it's less intelligent. So it's going to collapse your world. And if, you, if it helps your heart... It expands your world. For example, in that moment, okay, my intuition says turn. And intuition, by the way, isn't language. I just had the feeling, turn, not words, Sonia, get off the highway and go home. Yeah. Just turn. Okay, I went with it, and then my brain had a choice to fight me, to argue, or to say, let me help. And I, my brain is trained to say, let me help. So, so my brain said, okay, there's a reason for this, and I will be supportive. I will, I will help you explain or help you defend this choice instead of you're crazy, what are you doing? So you train your brain to help your intuition. You have the best of head and heart. Yeah. 
What, what is the, the place of the subconscious for you? Because we're talking about hurts, we're talking about vibration and whatever it means scientifically and, and, and symbolically, but I'm a big believer in, in that subconscious is like a, a huge storage. It is. And there's like a lot of super connections happening. So what is the place of that for you? I wrote about this in my first book. Yeah. Because intuition, Can you the, the title maybe? it's called The Psychic Pathway. Okay. Um, and that book actually talks about intuition is not one channel. It's three. The first channel of intuition is telepathy. Human beings are resonant, vibrational creatures, and we pick up on each other's thoughts. We can have the same idea at the same time. We're kind of reading each other's minds without language. It's like you're thinking a song, I start singing it. You know, we're broadcasting. So that's the first level. The second level is your subconscious mind. You've already had the experience, you've already read the book, you observed something, you overheard something, but you didn't consciously register it. But it's still there, so it's in the library, if, if you will. So you pull it up. And that's like when you start doing something. For example, you decide, I'm going to learn to paint. And all of a sudden, you have an aptitude. You, you're, you're good at this, better than, than anything you've studied, any reason that you've been trained consciously. But you have an aptitude. Now, here's where I'll differ from you. I believe in past lives. I believe our bodies are, tempor are only temporary, but our spirit lives on. So our subconscious is not just a huge library from this life. Mm. It's from everything. But in a sense, scientifically, it's true. Because if you, if you look at our uh, DNA and uh, what, what goes on with genetics, I mean, it's not the way you, you talk about it, but in a way... Through genetics, we have access to those past lives. We do things, we don't know what we do things. So I didn't teach that to my kid. What is doing that? So yeah, I didn't know it. And, and animals as well. So for sure there is some of that. But it's, I mean, all the, all the, the, the beliefs, even if I, uh, first of all, I don't know exactly what I believe in. I'm, I never said like, I know I uh, believe exactly in this and nothing is, there is not, no, there is nothing more. I'm, ne I'm never saying there is not nothing more, if I can say so. But, um, I mean, every beliefs help you. If a beliefs help you to be a better person, I think it's, it's useful in any ways, whether it's angel or, you know, that's, and I love that you're not forcing anyone. Of course not. <laughs> no, I don't have, I don't have any sort of a dogma. Yeah. I just am going with a very spontaneous, creative, extremely joyful, very generous receptivity to the universe. It will be good to me. I believe that if I'm open and available and listening to my vibes, which are very physically felt, they're not thoughts, that I will, that I'm being led. Birds have their own radar, whales have radar, bats have radar, why not us? We also have an organic radar that is, that is designed to bring us to the best scenarios. And I think our intellect, it's helpful, but a great deal of what is in people's heads is not what they feel or want or care about, it's indoctrination that was put in their heads by people that they needed to please for survival or for acceptance or approval. So you abandon yourself to fit in or to be safe. Yeah. And so your world gets out of synchronicity with your natural self, and there's no good outcome for that. So I don't have a dogma. I just say, don't trust. I never say trust me. I say trust your vibes. And you taught your kids to think that way. You were telling me that they, uh, Sabrina and Sonia, are uh, they, they are coaching as well. They're coach. They, they're great. Um, and we'll put something uh, right under for a link to their to what they do. And you told me that you raised them to be intuitive. So how do, how would that work in education? Well, here's how. Here's where it, it made me a bit of an unpopular parent <laughs> with the with the teachers because I empowered my children 
when they were, before they could barely speak, I said, if you don't feel good about something, if it's not right for you, all you have to do is squeeze my hand. You don't have to explain because their brains, maybe it's not obvious what it is. It's just energetic. And I said, the most important thing is always check your energy and make sure you feel good, not whoever else feels good. And so, like, here's an example that Sabrina was in preschool. She was three. And the teacher came in. It was a French school because I sent them to French school. And the teacher got mad at the three-year-olds very early and said, nobody's behaving, everybody time out. You have to all go sit in the corner and put your head in the corner. So Sabrina sits there for like a minute. And the teacher said, she told me this story after. She said she whispered and one kid way like nodded her head. And then she whispered and the boy nodded her head. And then she went up to the teacher and she said, teacher, we feel very good in the corner. And when you feel better, you can join us. <laughs> and she said, it was so funny. Plus, she had a fight with her husband, and she was in a bad mood, and it was so honest. Yeah. She couldn't get mad. She said, I couldn't believe this three-year-old calling me out. Yeah. And so that she said, normally, that would be, how dare you? Yeah, which is often the case that teachers uh, would pick it? up on. Because that act, yeah. so, so actually, I eventually, Sabrina never changed, neither did Sonia. Eventually, Sabrina's outspokenness required that I take her out of school and homeschool her, which was fine because the school, she had dyslexia and she had um, some AD, ADHD attention. Yeah. And they told me, I took her out of school when she was in sixth grade, seventh, because the teacher told me she is not able to learn math. And I said, no, you're not a good teacher for her, but don't tell her she's limited because you don't know what to do. So it, it, that's the kind of thing I pulled her out and I said, okay, there's a way for you to learn and we're going to figure it out. We're going to discover who supports you. And so I homeschooled her, and I found a tutor who is a college student who is very funny. He taught her one-on-one, -on -one, and when she took her college exams, math was her strongest score. It was the top, top, top score. So, but see, I'm a rebel. I'm just like, don't make my children doubt themselves. Don't do that. It's a big problem with school because they have also this, the, at each level they have a challenge. It's not... It's not impossible to solve it, but the teachers have to respect the program and, and also the track teachers that have to... I didn't have a problem with that. If the program that they have in that school doesn't fit her learning style, okay, I'll get a tutor. I had the problem that she was saying, Sabrina, you fundamentally can't learn. And that was my problem. Don't ever tell a child or any human being they can't learn. I feel very yeah, it's just passionate. There was another way to learn. There's a different way. They even don't call it learning disabilities. They call it learning differences. And every create, like Einstein had them and Thomas Edison had them. Thomas Edison's teacher sent a note home with him that said this child is unteachable. And his mom got the note and he said, what'd she say? And she said, your teacher said you're a genius. <laughs> I love that. That was like, that's a, that's a great story. And that's the kind of parent... Yes, because your parent is supposed to see who you are and who you are becoming. Yeah. And the teachers sometimes are so busy with their curriculum, they're not interested in who you are. They're interested in making you part of their curriculum. So I think our education right now is outdated. I think it's not being current with, with what life is asking of us. So yeah. The way to teach is outdated but also the also the curriculum because you're not learning life at school like we're talking about right. that in, uh, with our new companies but um you're not learning anything that's gonna i mean you're learning some things but there are so many subjects that are not going to teach you concrete practical advice for your life later i think what's missing and why i love your company is they're not teaching you how to creatively problem solve and how to have confidence and draw from your inner self the resources 
to do that. And yet that's what makes humans happy. When we find a challenge and we creatively draw from ourselves and come up with solutions and not be afraid to take risks. That's the key. If you study any genius in the world, any leader on any field, they will say the reason they were successful is they trusted their vibes, not they trusted their example or their, their limits or what everybody else said. So you, I think the curriculums need to change and give children the, the, the support and the context and the opportunity to be resourceful and creative and problem solving. Because problem solving is, uh, at school, is approached from a very specific angle. All the problem you're going to have to solve them with math, first of all, which is not true because some of the problems in life, yes, you're going to have to solve them with life, but most of the problems are not They're like relational. that. relational. Exactly, relational and with self-awareness, like you said before. And if you don't succeed, it's binary. You don't succeed, oh, then you're nothing. not good at it. Right, you are, con you are told something's wrong with you. Yeah. And our world is very depressed because we get the feedback that if we don't do or perform to the expectations of an authority figure, we are fundamentally flawed. And that system, I believe, is at a tipping point. It's cracking apart. The world has changed too much for that authoritarian patriarchal system, which is you do what I tell you if you're going to survive. And the thing about what I'm teaching, more than intuition and more than angels and guides, I am teaching you, you have an authentic self that's brilliant. Give it the opportunity to lead and listen to it and respect it, and it will take care of you. Your natural, authentic, and creative, intuitive self is a, is a genius. I'm thinking about all the entrepreneurs uh, out there listening to this podcast and how all this applied to them. And I want to talk about this in a minute. I, just, I was just wondering what were the biggest, because it seems about your career, coming back to, to what we're mm -hmm. talking, that it seems that it was kind of too easy, you know? And for all the entrepreneurs out there, I know it's never that lean, that, that it's never that easy, but there was a part of it. So what are the well, challenges you met at the bit? Well, here's the thing. I don't think any of my life was easy. It wasn't easy to go home and tell my husband I just walked away. In fact, I took a lot of crap for it. I took a lot of negative resentment. And, so it's not easy, but it was worth it. It was worth it saying I'd rather be aligned with myself and do what I really care about than to um, be fake or be unhappy or be frustrated or angry or n negative or a victim. So, but I do think what the challenge is and what I, this is what I notice people don't have. There's two things that get in your way and I think they will cripple you in life. The first is a, an exaggerated fear of disappointment. If I do this, what if it doesn't work out? I can't stand the thought of failure. I can't stand that to the point I won't take the effort. I won't, make, I won't try. And it cripples you. And the second thing that cripples you is I'm doing this because I want a guaranteed outcome of money instead of I'm doing this because it's fun and I love it. And you just have to suspend so I tell my students, don't quit your day job. Don't, you don't start out as a master. Do what you do. And I was a flight attendant. I was a cocktail waitress. I worked in an office. I babysat. I did other things while I was developing this. But I never said, oh, I'm going to do this and make a lot of money. It was, it was the power of attraction. I was just good at something that I loved. And it kept showing up. But I was consistent. I always did it. I always kept showing up. When I grew up doing what I do, let's, re let's face it, if you're going to say, look, I do intuitive readings, I'm intuitive, that's like the most um, disrespected career in the world. I mean, let's just, I, I am quite clear. Everyone wants to call bullshit on that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know that, but it wasn't bullshit. Yeah. I, you know, I never even, and to this day, don't even have a business card. 
I don't carry one. It's all. And now it's good because yeah. now it's outdated. But right, before, but I never, ever, ever promoted myself. I just did what I did, and I believe, and I have where I coach global leaders. Literally, I have companies that people who run global companies as my clients these days. And what every one of them said was, I trusted my vibes. I just didn't tell anyone. I covered it up. But ultimately, the decisions that brought me here, I kept secret because I didn't want the judgment. You cannot, it, you can literally cannot back it up with logic because there is no, yeah. sometimes there is no logic. You yeah. just feel that I did this, I see it, I just see it, I need to do it, right? So how, then people are, yeah, but why? See, so th that's hard. a different, that's so what I say here as an entrepreneur, what you do is you say, I did it because I felt like it and I'm willing to stand with the consequences. Yeah. That's, you're out. It's like, I'm not right, I'm not wrong, I'm in a third space, but I did it because I wanted to and I, it was worth taking the consequence. If I fail, I fail. If I win, I win. But I don't need you to tell me your permission. I've been called bullshit so many times in my life. I guess. I tell people I have snake medicine. And snake medicine is a Native American uh, metaphor for when you've been bitten so many times, you become immune. Uh. I have been criticized so much. I have been laughed at, dismissed. But my life has worked. Now I have 27 books in 37 countries, and I've sold over 2 million books, never advertising. What kind of work ethic does it take to write 27 books? Love. I love it. I'm not working. I'm talking on paper about what I love. And I'm just sharing the ideas about it in ways that can be creative to any scenario. So I'm not, I'm just having a conversation with you, just like this. That's my books. People, when they read them, say, I feel like you're talking to me. And, it, and it's, I am. I'm just having a conversation. I'm not, I'm not, I'm just saying, try this and see what happens. What is the annoying part for you of writing a book? Editing, the left brain stuff. The, the, I don't even know how to type, for one thing. I never, but I just, it's like, I don't go to that left brain world. So I'm like typing and correcting. And the first 15 books, I had someone type for me. I wrote them by hand. Oh. My brother, I have an older brother who told me when I was 14, never to learn to type or I would be a secretary. <laughs> so I took his advice and I don't know if that was such a good idea. I don't like editing because it's so tedious. You got to go back and you got to go back and correct. Um, it's slow and it's, but it's been good for me. It's taught me to slow down and I'm very fast in that it's got me grounded and it's taught me to be organized. I've learned, but it's not my favorite thing. What, to be organized? To to have to be methodical and grounded and or to be left brained. It's you need both. And I find that often on a lot of people come to me who want to be entrepreneurs. They say I wanna, you know, I wanna start a I wanna I wanna be a coach, for example. I wanna quit my job and be a coach. And it's like, okay, but you don't you you can't. You've got to learn how to work with people. You have to learn how to listen to people. You have to build your reputation. True success is primarily the process of attraction. People are drawn to you because your vibration is congruent with your interests as your creative. Yeah. If you don't have that congruency and you're just doing it because you, in your head, you got an idea. People are naturally intuitive. They're going to feel they can't quite put their finger on what's wrong with you. You say all the right words, but it feels funky. This is so true. Even uh, again, even if we don't talk with the same, I don't, I don't use usually the vibra vi vi vibrations and, and stuff like that, but it's totally true that people feel whatever the, the hell they feel or they read on, on you, that they're not the, the, the kind of person you are. It's and not matching. It's not matching. And, and when... I think a lot of people are kind of isolated or, or, or alone because they don't allow themselves to just open up. and Right. There's a book, and you're 
listeners should listen. It's a book or a podcast. A woman named Amy Cuddy, C-U-D-D-Y. She wrote a book called Presence. And she has a YouTube or a TED Talk on Presence. She has all the research about what I'm talking about. They did research that if you're genuine and authentic and open and, and you're available and you're not hiding, people feel it. And she was talking, interestingly enough, about people who are entrepreneurs trying to pitch to get venture capitalism. And they said they came, there were people who had all the, the right um, requirements and they had good arguments, and they, but they didn't have presence. Then they had others who had this open, enthusiastic, absolute conviction that this was the thing, and they're the ones that got the money. They had the good vibes. Yeah. So there's even now, thank God, science there's is... There's a physicality to it. Yeah, there's a, she was talking about a whole vibration. So vibration is now coming into scientific yeah. languaging. So our worlds, your world and my world, are converging. The language is bridging it. So, you know, we have different language, but we're really approaching it from, this, from different vantage points, but we're arriving at the same conclusion. Yeah. Humans are energetic beings. And when your energy is congruent and harmonious with your head, your heart, your words, your, your choices, your movement, when they are consistent, you're very attractive. So here's a tough question for you. How bring is it <laughs> bringing out how are the good vibes in Paris? <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Um, they've changed. I have found initially that the vibration of Paris was difficult because I was an outsider. So I was judging. And I found that that was an ego approach. It's like... You're not like me, so I'm judging. But as I got more comfortable and more familiar and understood, I thought they're not, they're French. We'll talk about Parisians. I thought you have no, you have no sense of humor. You're not, you're, you're, you're very cold. But I found that's not true. I found that as the more I studied them, that I had to learn what was funny to them. I had to learn that they have very strong pride and they have very strong traditions that, that, that give them foundation, but they can also make fun of them. And I wasn't respecting any of that until I learned. So I think that's an important thing. Before you draw your conclusions or go to your intuition, learn all you can, with, but with an open mind. With an, and that would be in any business or any situation. Now I find that... There, that the vibes of France are changing. When I've, I've been here five years, and like now, almost every day I'm getting a call from a French company or a French um, person who wants to interview me. There's more interest in what I do, and I swear it's because I changed my attitude. Yeah. And I quit seeing myself as the other. Yeah. I thought, I'm here, and I'm part of this. And then it changed. So I really don't think... I learned and proved to myself that there is not an another. We're all ultimately the same, and the game is to find out how. Instead of, oh, we're different, and I can judge you, or you judge me. Because that's a problem in the world. But if I am interested, and I got interested and got past my own discomfort, I find it as comfortable here now as anywhere I've ever been. But I had to change, not the outside. And you wrote a book about it. I wrote a book, and the, my frame of mind in that book was I was suffering. But I always knew I came here to learn. I came here to learn to first be alone. I mean, I came from a family of seven and was married to a man who was the oldest of nine. I grew up in a tribe. I was never alone in my... I never even had my own name. My mom had the same name and my grandmother. It's like I didn't have anything of my own. Hmm. So I had to learn to be alone and be happy in my, my aloneness without being lonely. So that's what my big, that was my big evolution. Because everything is about evolution. Your vibrate, your intuition and your creativity are all about evolving and giving you a bigger world, not a smaller world. 
And you left uh, Paris recently for uh, at this period of the, the I COVID. I did. I went for three months. I went to London for three months. I really loved it because of the language. Oh, it's refreshing for yeah, you. Yeah, it's refreshing to speak my own language yeah. because there's a certain connection. And there's a lot... UK is a lot more similar to US in terms of just way of life. But it's interesting. After three months, I missed the beauty. This country has a, a value of beauty that I don't feel I've noticed in, in other cultures. Visually, you mean the buildings? I think everything. The food is beautiful. The language is beautiful. You sound like you're singing. The, the architecture is beautiful. When you go to someone's home and they serve you dinner, they make, they make it beautiful. Nothing is ever done without some degree of beauty. It's, it's something I don't notice in other cultures like this. Like, it's really part of the value system, and that's what I love about it. Waking Up in Paris is the, yeah. the title of the book. It's yes. great. I read it. It's funny. Yeah. It's very funny. You know, when you're, in, when, you have, when you're in your heart, intuition isn't a bypass for life. It's not going to protect you from pain, but it'll <laughs> certainly help you get through it in a, in, a, in a deeper way. And every intuitive person I know has a good sense of humor and can laugh, even when it's terrible you know and i i was grateful because i was as as miserable as i was it's like my mother used to say the situation is critical but never serious you know there's always a part of me that could see this and think this is just ridiculous life can be super ridiculous when you're not suffering it so it was coming here helped me feel It gave me the ability to be comfortable in any place in the world alone. I was always with my husband or my kids or my siblings or my, you know, I always was a tribe. In fact, at one point in my life here, actually, I went at various points in my life, but I went to a therapist here and she said, you know, when you refer to yourself, you say we, you don't say I. And I realized my thinking was always It's us. It's the whole group, not me, alone. And so I had to kind of learn that. It was just so indoctrinated in my, my experience of life. There was never a me thing. It was always a we thing. It's oh, interesting. Never thought of it the, that way. Yeah. And then it was like, not only is it we, I have siblings, I have a husband with siblings, I have you know, 50 immediate family members, but then I also have angels and guides and helpers, so I also have an invisible we. So I'm always an entourage in my own internal experience. I'm never alone. And I had to kind of look at that and go, okay, I got to think I. It was a, it was a learning curve. Hmm. And what, what, uh, what Paris taught you about that? Paris, what Paris taught me You know, right now in the world, there's a lot of talk about the toxic masculine, right? Patriarchy, toxic masculine. But I think there's a toxic feminine, too. And the toxic feminine is victim. Why is this happening to me? Why is nobody taking care of me? And women are trained to expect that. And I came here in that frame of mind. I'm a good person. Nobody took care of me. And Paris taught me to get over that. <laughs> like, literally, literally get over it <laughs> pretty much it was like we don't want to hear your sad story shut up you know get out of here and so i thought okay tough lesson but good it was tough but good that's something always come uh, coming back to me when we talk about tough lessons as well is and and it's also also circling back to what we we're saying before so when when we hear do what you love seems like it's all going to be pink and lovely. And what do you think about this advice when people say, do what you love? It I say, do what you love, but you have to earn the right for it to pay your way. Hmm. Keep your day job. Do what you love and be, be, be willing to do whatever it takes to support doing what you love. It doesn't, just because you love it doesn't mean it's going to interesting and immediately become a, a source of revenue. You have to earn that. 
there's a, there's a trajectory. It's first you're a student, so you learn about it. Then there's what's called apprentice, so you learn with teachers. You get your examples, you get your online courses or whatever. Then there's something called journeyman, which is learn by doing. And that takes you to mastery, which is when you can start making some money. Somewhere between journeyman and mastery. But you don't get to say, I had the, a client come and she said, I want to be an actress. I love acting. And then six months later, she came back and she said, you said that was a good idea, but I'm quitting. I didn't get any jobs. And I said, well, you're not good enough. Just because you want to doesn't mean you possess the skill. You have to earn the right to expect revenue. You don't just, you're not entitled. And I do think that that do what you love, if you're not careful, don't assume that entitles you to anything. Yeah, it can be dangerous if you take it. If you're not thorough. Yeah, if you don't, if you don't know how much work it takes. I actually think it's kind of arrogant. Of what? You say do what you love? To do what you love and expect that that alone is going to make you a rich, famous person. You know, people are all this. I've written a lot of books. They've taken a lot of time. And people say, I want to write a book. I want to be on Oprah. It's like, okay, well, <laughs> good luck with that because there's a whole lot of work in between I want to and this end result I'm hoping to have. And I don't hear you talking about that. You told me once that you had to, your first book, you tried to promote it at yourself. You went to a store. What was the I, story? Well, I, actually, what I did is I printed it at a, like an office depot. Yeah. And I printed and in a pink cover 5,000 copies. And I took them to bookstores locally and sold them over the counter. Wow. And here's how I got published. I talked my way into them and the people would say, what's that? And then one day, Random House, which is a big publisher, the representative said to the bookstore owner, what's your best-selling book? And he said, well, strangely enough, it's this homegrown thing. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got published. He said, it's a best-selling book. So they came back and asked me. I never presented my book to a publisher. I never had an agent to go. But that's just my grace although i can tell you i've taught a lot of people for over 40 years and a lot of people have stories similar to mine because they you trust your vibes and you do the work consistently it's two things it's you 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 follow your intuition and you show up every day and you don't complain and you don't quit and you can do that because you love it and because it's really coming from your heart you can't do that for something you don't love You can't. But if you love it, you keep going back because love is faithful. If you're loving it, you're going to faithfully show up. It gives you fuel as well, like yeah. motivation. If you love it, you don't... You don't... Yeah, it feeds you. It, it's its own reward. Yeah. So I feel like if you're not loving it, what? if you're not loving it, I'm suspicious that it will support you long term. Even if you learned how to hack the code to make short-term money, Your spirit will leave and say, I don't want to do this. Yeah. You cannot fake it for too long. No, you're, even if you're making money, people want to quit. So it's simply a matter. When I say trust your vibes, another way to say it is trust your authentic self. Trust that real core self in you because it's smart. It knows what it's doing better than your brain. And your brain can help. And I love that you, even though you have uh, so much success, you continuously try new things and trying to hire this new guy about this. Uh, every time, oh, I know this person, I'm trying this, and this doesn't work that well, but I've tried that. So this is also a great example that it's not that then it's done. You know, no, you're successful never and then arrive. <laughs> I like to be creative. It's my sport. Yeah. And I am not afraid of failure. I have to say that has to do with my mom and dad. They never gave me the value system that I have to succeed. My mom was deaf, and so she, she only had her inner self to listen to for the most part. And my dad was just a farmer who sold farm equipment. So he was busy. He had too many kids to be telling me to succeed in life. He just said, just do it. Just, just keep yourself happy and don't cause a problem. It was pretty much my value system from my parents. Just, and my mom would say every day, there's always a solution. Find it. 
Whatever problem she would say, to this day, she's 90. Always a solution. Find it. Find it. That's the game. And that's how intuition develops. And it helps you to be optimist. Yes. I'm very optimistic. I always, ex I always expect... You think it's necessary as an entrepreneur? I definitely do. I think that if you're negative, then you doubt your own experience. So people around you are going to feel it. Why should they believe for you and in you what you don't trust yourself? However, I also think we can get discouraged and I think we can lose energy. So we need to surround ourselves with people who believe in us and will help us through those moments that we're having a bad day or a bad week or a bad episode. I think we, we can't succeed alone. I say even Jesus had 12 helpers, so good <laughs> example. You, can't, you don't do it alone. Yeah. Well, I think that's great. I think we, we took enough of your time. Uh, where can we find, show you book? I want to show you a book. Uh, trust Your Vibes. I think you should read that cover to cover and then leave We it. have the cover behind and here. Um, Secret Tools for Sin Sixth Sensory Living. Yeah, what were you saying? That's the kind of book you should read cover to cover and then leave on the coffee table or in the bathroom and check all the time because it's just little bite-sized things that teach you. One little thing at a time. It's like, try this, do this, see what happens. It's like 63 suggestions to make your intuition wake up. Nice. And where can we find you on social media? So Sonia Choquette? Sonia Choquette. Instagram, okay. Facebook. I'm going to put all the links okay. uh, on the bottom anyways. Oh, and my podcast. And your podcast is, is brand new, right? Brand new. January 8th, June 8th. Tell us about it. It's called It's All Related. Yeah. And it really is about everything we're talking about. Everything connects to everything. It's with my daughters. They're both... Um, we talk about how we were raised, all, my, I was in, from my mom, they were from their mom, but how we were raised intuitively. And it's not just, their lives are working too. It's like the system works yeah. instead of just, I'm lucky. Yeah. So we kind of talk about the system of this intuitive system and it's not as reckless as it appears. <laughs> it does appear. It appears like it's like very out of control, but there's enough evidence over many generations that maybe this system might work yeah cool well i'm excited uh, to have some more episodes of that I've, I've listened to the first one it's on spotify it's everywhere itunes itunes yeah. yeah cool well thanks for your time sonia and um if you guys have uh, any questions you put it in the comments and uh sonia is not going to answer it because <laughs> she's busy but <laughs> no we'll definitely uh, answer some uh, of your questions and maybe I see you soon on another podcast. I'd love to. Yeah, in live or, or just recorded like that. Okay. All right. Thank right you so there. much. My pleasure.